Hey, welcome everyone. In this video, we'll be doing a review of the Amazon Fire TV Cube 2019 model, along with a major 2021 software update that kind of breathes in brand new life to this media player. This unit is pricey for a media player, costing $150 Canadian or $120 US. It's expensive because like other Fire TV devices, it has built in, but what makes it unique is that it supports far field commands. Basically, you don't have to tap the button on the remote to activate the smart assistant. It'll act like an echo device in the sense that it's always listening for your commands. In fact, you can command it to turn on your TV and Fire TV Cube. For example, turn on the TV. That hefty price tag also gives you the best and fastest performing Fire TV device currently available with a hexa-core processor. But I don't want to get into the specifics. What's important is performance, which I'll be dumbing throughout this video. The big bummer, with this expensive price tag, there's no HDMI cable in the box. Yeah. Going back to the remote design, it's compact, thin, and gets the job done nicely. Reaching for navigation and media controls is easy enough, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a dedicated button. The remote is powered by two AAA batteries. Basically the idea is that you use your voice commands to open and play content. So for example, you tell your voice assistant to, hey, open and play uh, Supernatural on Prime Video, and it will do that. Although you can use the remote if you really want to. There's also an IR blaster built into this remote. So if your TV, soundbar, or AV system is compatible, you can control the volume and power for those devices from this one remote. There's also a Fire TV remote app available for smartphones, which works incredibly well. Switching back to the Cube media player, it's small like a compact echo unit. It's measuring in at 3.38 by 3.38 by 2.99 inches. The bottom has rubber feet to prevent any scratches if it's placed on a glass stand, for example. On the back, there are ports for micro USB, which allows connecting the included ethernet adapter. Although what's disappointing is that this port should have been USB-C and not micro USB. Continuing on, there's a port for the IR extender, HDMI output, and a port for power. Keep in mind that the power cable will take up multiple spots on a power bar. The power wire itself is about five feet long. On the top of the controls from muting the microphone, the volume controls, and action buttons, which enables listening for commands or turning off an alarm, just to name a couple examples. This media player has a Wi-Fi 5 adapter and not Wi-Fi 6, which I'll let it slide this time since this unit was released in 2019, and Wi-Fi 6 was only just becoming popular at the time. It also uses Bluetooth 5.0 for private content listening over a Bluetooth wireless headset, although I notice a fraction of a second audio delay. That's only because I'm reviewing this unit, I'm specifically looking for issues like that. An average person probably won't notice that slight audio delay. You can also connect Bluetooth gaming controllers, which I'll get back into later on, but you can also pair wireless keyboard and mouse. It only has 16 gigabytes of internal storage, which is a little small at this price point. For a media player, it should have been at least 32 gigs, although 64 would have been preferable. The media player and remote only come in a simple black color. For audio, it supports Dolby Atmos, Dolby Digital, and Dolby Digital Plus. For video, it supports 4K at 60 frames a second, as well as Dolby Vision, HDR10, HDR10+, and HLG. So let's go over into the software side of things. So basically, we'll start with the interface going left to right and go over how the new interface has been improved, but how some things are still kind of annoying, and I'll point this out very quickly for you. So starting over in the far left, we have profiles, where essentially you can have, you know, the way your apps are set up, your interface, for example, uh, different watch list and pre preference of, of media. So you have profiles there, which is pretty cool. Over on the home tab, you have some things going on. So you'll have this consistent banner at the top, which is like trailers for movie and stuff. And over on home, the remainder of it at the bottom is majority prime content. You'll have stuff like popular movies and TV shows from your subscriptions. So this might include some minor Netflix stuff, for example, but majority of it is prime. And then one thing you'll notice here is that you have advertisements. Yeah, you, you paid for this media player only to get advertisements shoved in your face. Um, so these ads will actually change from time to time. You'll have recently viewed apps, but we'll get more into the app section a bit better later on. Um, then you have Prime Recommended, and then a quick banner for Netflix, and then Recently Watched. But Recently Watched is limited to Prime content only, okay? Then you have Features, Apps, and Games. Prime, 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 Prime. And then you'll get the idea that it's majority Prime. But just generally, you know, aside from the ads and excessive prime content shoved in your face, one thing I want to point out quickly is how quick and responsive the interface is. 
Even with this huge 2021 upgrade on the software interface, it's incredibly fast and responsive. So the search function is basically the ability to search for everything. It could be apps, it could be content, and it doesn't have to be prime content, it could be everything. So you can tap on the search button here, or you can just use the uh, microphone button on the remote. I'll use the remote instead. Plex. And there you go, so it can search apps, as I mentioned. Uh, what else you can do is the Mandalorian. And there you go, it found a result from a Disney Plus streaming service. And because it's a full-fledged smart assistant, you can actually control your home devices if they're compatible with it. So, for example, you won't be able to see it, but just a quick sample. Turn on the dining room lights. Okay. And of course you can search through genre of certain content if you want to. Uh, so going over to live, this is basically a quick collection of apps that will show you live content. So it could be news, it could be sports, for example. And app availability, not just live, but in general, will vary depending on where you live. And over on the right, just ever so slightly, we have just a quick access to certain apps that you might be uh, of interest. Um, I don't know why they put photos and music. I, I don't care about it, but that's the way Amazon designed it. But if you go a little bit more to the far right, you can actually view all your listed apps here. Now, because this is running Android at the core, you can sideload Android apps on this device. I have another video explaining how to get that done. A link to that is in the video description. But just going over general app responsiveness. So we'll go, we'll start with Prime Video, for example, uh, which is somewhat of a heavy app. It's incredibly fast and responsive. Um, so there's, there's no delay. And if you're usually playing original content from Prime or Netflix, just as an example, and 4K HDR, the quality is incredible. A, the picture quality is fantastic. You will not be disappointed. Another heavy app that I want to quickly demonstrate is Netflix. You see how fast it loads up. It's incredibly quick. And Netflix tends to be more often than not a very heavy uh, app. So going over YouTube and Disney Plus very quickly at the same time, uh, the experience is pretty much what you expect. So YouTube opens up and loads very quickly. The interface is pretty much exactly what you expect from another media player app. And Disney Plus, even though it it's, is a heavy app, it works pretty quick and fast. Uh, it's The experience is pretty stellar. So I want to touch base on some technical information in Plex. So Plex can pay 720p and 1080p content and MKV, MP4 file format, whether it be H.264 or H.265 compression, just fine. It will experience no issue. It can play 4K videos in MP4 and MKV file format and H.264 for the most part just fine. Um, H.265 usually is okay as well for either full file format and 4K. I do have one video with heavy compression H.265 MKV file format, it's 4K. It struggles to play it. It'll play it for maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, buffer, stop, I have to go back, play it again. Um, but that's a heavily compressed video, so most people won't experience that issue. Now, when it comes to a very large file, so this is raw files from my video camera, okay? They play back in MP4, H.264, but at 150 megabits per second bitrate, which is incredibly big, okay? Here's the thing. It'll play for a few seconds, stutter. Play for a few seconds and stutter. I don't know if the Fire TV Cube literally doesn't have the processing power to keep playing it consistently, or if it's a network limitation. The reason I say that is because even if I'm sitting right next to my router and I'm very close to it, this media player at the end of the day is still running a Wi-Fi 5 uh, network adapter. It's not Wi-Fi 6, so Wi-Fi is not the best. The other limitation is that even with Ethernet, ironically, it'll still bottleneck because it's 10 slash 100 for the Ethernet adapter they provide in the box. And this is 150 megabits per second, so the network is going to bottleneck no matter what. So I don't even know if this Fire TV has the capability processing power to play it. Now, I have tried plugging in a USB stick with this same file in the micro USB port, but Amazon has blocked any ability to play USB uh, external drives. I've tried it with file explorers, various ones. I've tried opening it through VLC because I have loaded VLC on this media player. It can't be done. So those examples I provided of the very heavy uh, video files that couldn't play properly due to network issues or maybe the processing power, I don't know which is the bottleneck. Don't be concerned because that's for extremely rare circumstances for hardcore media enthusiasts like myself. It's very rare. For everyone else, it'll be just fine. 
Going over to the system settings menu, I'm not gonna get into too much because most of it is boring. Going over to equipment control, this is where you can add additional devices to be potentially compatible with your Fire TV Cube remote. For example, if you wanna pair your sound bar and control it with the remote, this is where you try to add the device and see if it's compatible or not. Uh, remotes and Bluetooth devices, you can connect additional Fire TV remotes. Maybe you lost it for whatever reason. So for game controllers, you can pair PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox One S and One X, and Xbox Series X controllers. All four console controller types, I have videos explaining how to get that done in the description. The only one that's wonky is PlayStation 5. Uh, the button mapping is very strange, and there's no button mapping option within the uh, interface here. Unless you download a game on the Fire TV Cube that has button mapping, maybe you can adjust it, but your PlayStation 5 controller won't play nice. Try using an Xbox controller instead or a PlayStation 4 controller. Mobile devices, pretty uh, miscellaneous devices, such as cell phones and stuff. You won't get too much out of it. I, I don't even know the purpose of it because other Bluetooth devices does pretty much the same thing and more. You can connect a wireless keyboard or mouse, wireless headset for audio private listening. Going over to preferences, there's a couple of cool things I want to touch base on very quickly. One is parental controls, which you can restrict certain, uh, you know, restricted content, for example. You can prevent kids from accessing your credit card information and making purchases, for example, so pretty cool stuff. And then diving into data monitoring, this is where you have the ability to cap certain data usage. So if you have limited data um, amounts from your ISP per month, so maybe you're capped at 200 gigs per month, this is where you can set limitations on how much data is used, maybe adjust the video quality. So instead of 4K, you're watching 1080p content. So pretty cool that Amazon added this in here. Okay, so I'm gonna be playing Asphalt 8 as kind of like a graphics demo performance test for this uh, media player. I do know that Asphalt 9 is available for the Fire TV Cube. I'm not gonna play that on purpose. I'm using Asphalt 8 as a benchmarking game. The reason being is because it has some pretty heavy graphics for a media player. And I've also reviewed the Fire TV Stick from 2018, which is a 4K version, and the Fire TV Stick from 2020, which is a 1080p version. Both of them are still being sold, um, and I'm using this as kind of like the benchmarking game. So one of the things that I noticed with those two media players is that the frame rate would tend to drop quite a bit. Uh, but here with the Fire TV Cube, it's pretty stellar performance. I noticed it's very minor frame rate dropping. I'm not sure if the camera would pick it up, but not to the same extent as the Fire TV Stick devices. Those aren't really you know, the most powerful pieces of hardware. They're great as media players, but if you want to play some games like this and hook up an Xbox or a PlayStation controller, which you can and is compatible with this game, then you can certainly do that. So uh, this is evidence to me that this is the most powerful media player easily from Amazon to date. Look, this is overall a rock solid media player, but what I don't appreciate is how it's overpriced. In Canada and US, it should have been reduced by 40 to $50 in each region. Uh, having an Echo device and a media player combined into one doesn't justify the price tag, especially because they're shoving ads in your face and overly excessive pushing prime content on the user. You could have bought a Fire TV stick separately and an Echo device separately for less than half the price, but does the exact same thing almost as this media player, almost. The other big caveat is that you can't connect an external storage unit. So why am I paying such a hefty price tag? Hard to justify, but still, again, the performance is rock solid and will meet most people's needs for a regular media player. So if you found this video useful, be sure to check out my social links in the description. Hit the like button, it does help. Subscribe, and thanks for watching.